Palm Sunday. Well, we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This is one week before his successful resurrection, when he rose again from the grave. We find this story in Matthew 21, 1 through 11. This is the uh, NI, um, NLT version. As Jesus and the disciples approached uh, Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them um, on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you'll see a donkey tied there with, a colt, with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you what you're doing, just say the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and the others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the possession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked, and the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, as Jesus entered that city, he neared a long finish that had been this journey that he was embarked upon was planned before the foundation of the earth was laid. That's how long Jesus had known he was going to have to sacrifice himself for humanity. Before the foundation of the, before the first sin, this was already known. He had to come and save the lost world. Now was the time to do that. Didn't mean it was easy. He actually prayed blood, the agony. But he, pray, he did it for us because we had to have salvation. We often call this Passion Week. It's the final seven days of Jesus' earthly ministry. And the beginning of the end for Satan. Beginning of the end. Jesus is getting ready to conquer death forever. We've got Jesus traveling up to the Mount Olives. He sent a couple of the disciples ahead to Bethpage. They found it, just like Jesus said, and just as they said they would. And when they untied it, the owners began to question them. The disciples responded with the answer that Jesus had provided. The Lord needs it. Amazingly, the owners were satisfied with that answer and let the disciples go. Amazing. Everything Jesus has spoken came about the way he's talked about it, the way he spoke it. Everything. There's no point ever that didn't get fulfilled that Christ made. Everything that's still to come will happen with that same assurity. As Jesus ascended towards Jerusalem, a large gathered crowd gathered around him. You know, people tend to gather where they want to hear what is being said. You'll look at political rallies. Some of them are masses of people. Other ones, not so much. They go to where they hear the message they want to hear. The crowd understood that Jesus was the Messiah. They understood that. What they did not understand, that it wasn't time for Jesus to set up the earthly kingdom. Jesus tried to over and over. His own disciples had a hard time grasping that the Messiah is not here to save Israel, to save Jerusalem. To, to, he's here as a ministry. A very large crowd spread their coats on the road while others cut branches. Well, in putting their coats on the road, the people were giving Jesus what's known as the royal treatment, the same treatment that King 
Jehu got when he was coronated. That's in Second Kings, Second Kings nine thirteen. And Jesus records the details that the branches they cut were from palm trees. So, hence, we call it Palm Sunday. On that first Palm Sunday, the people who honored Jesus verbally, they went ahead, shouting, Hosanna, son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed in the highest. In their praise, they were quoting Psalms 118, 25, and 26, which was an acknowledged uh, prophecy of Christ. This allusion to a messianic palm drew the resentment from the religious leaders. Some of them in the crowd, Pharisees, told Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus saw no need to rebuke people telling the truth. So he replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. These Pharisees were so afraid that they plotted more intently in their heart to have Christ killed. 450 uh, to 500 years prior to Jesus coming into um, Jerusalem, Zechariah prophesied the event we now call Palm Sunday. Here's what Zechariah had to say about 500 years ahead of time. Our tablet's nice. Here we go. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9.9. 9. So 500 years ahead of time, it was prophesied. Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. Fulfilled it just the way that he knew he would before the foundation of the earth was laid. Prophecy and all prophecies have been filled or will be filled. Jerusalem was welcoming their new king. They were happy, shouting, singing, praising. This was a joyous time. But it was not going to last long. Because the crowds looked for the Messiah, Messiah who would rescue them politically from Rome, free them nationally. Jesus come to save them spiritually. It's kind of a first things first with God. Let's get them saved spiritually, and then we'll set up a kingdom. Man's primary need has always been spiritual, not physical. It's not been political, cultural, or national. It's salvation. Even as the countless multitudes waved the palm branches and shouted for joy, they missed the true reason. They could not see or understand the cross. That very reason is why Jesus, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but it is now hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's Luke 19, 41, 47. It's tragic to see the Savior but not recognize him. Sadly, that after 2,000 years, there are many today that see Jesus and not recognize him. I don't know of anyone in our nation, probably most of the world, that have not heard the name of Jesus. I really don't. Everybody. Sometimes they use it in a very bad way, but they know the name of Jesus. But they don't recognize him for who he is. The same crowds that were crying out Hosanna, throwing down their coats, putting down them palm branches, 
just a short time later, were screaming, crucify him. Uh, Matthew 27, 22, and 23. Crucify him. How do you go from Hosanna, Lord, to crucify? You do that because your expectations were not met. Yes, they went to this, what we call a big rally, but they went with an expectation of Jesus being, doing, and saying something other than what he did. While he promised to fulfill everything, they wanted it in their time. They wanted it now. You know, it's kind of like kids. You can tell a kid something. Well, I will get you this. Once you say that to a kid, they're not going to leave you alone till they get it. They're going to hound you. You know, these people were like that. They were screaming, crucify them. There is coming a day, though, and I believe it's coming soon, when every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. There will be no denying it that day. For many, it will be too late. But every knee will bow, every mouth, every tongue confess. John gives us a scene from heaven. We don't have nearly enough scenes from heaven to satisfy my mind. I wish I knew more. But we're told what God wants us to know. And like a child, I need to be content and wait. But this is in Revelation 7, um, 9 through 10. Therefore, before me was a great multitude that no man could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Get that. A large multitude that no man could count. Every tribe, nation, language all over. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. So we're going to have palm branches in heaven. I don't know what else, but I know one thing we're going to have. These palm-bearing saints will shout, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And who can measure the sum of their joy? It's a joyous, non-measurable, uncountable host celebrating the risen Christ. My question for you this morning, will you be among them? Will you be among this multitude in the white robes? Will you be celebrating Christ for eternity? Right now, if you're hearing my voice live or on video, but if you're hearing it, it's not too late for you to be saved. Don't care what you've done, what you've done in the past. Don't care what you're doing right now. It's not too late to be saved. You can repent, which simply means turn around, which simply means go to God, confess, believe in your heart, mind, soul, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came, was crucified, dead, buried, and rose again three days later. If you believe that to be true, and it is true, you will be saved. There's not a lot of magic formulas you got to do. You don't have to join a bunch of organizations. You don't have to send a nickel to me. It's all free because God paid the price. There is no cost for us. Jesus Christ paid the biggest cost that's ever been paid in eternity. And that was to secure your salvation. That was to secure your place in heaven. That was to secure where you're going to spend eternity. You and your family, me and my family, we're going to join that multitude, that uncountable multitude, we're going to praise God for eternity. I don't know what else is going on in heaven. I do know one thing. I'm going to like every second of it. Amen. Let's go to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message today. I thank you for the words. 
I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that you have given so much, that you have given us so much, and that we're so unworthy. We're like the tax collector. Do not let us be like the Pharisee. Do not give us a prideful heart, but give us a humble heart, a thankful heart, a loving heart. Give us what we need, Father, to worship you. You love the humble heart. You cannot abide by the prideful heart. Let no pride be found in us. The only pride that I have is in what Jesus Christ did. I pray, Father, like Paul, that we keep striving for this perfection which we've not obtained till we finish line, till we get the goal, till we get that ring, till we get our eternal home. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.